Good morning and welcome. Special welcome to those who are watching online. It's good for us to be together for worship wherever we happen to be. Some announcements as we begin. Please remember that the Shopping with the Stars gifts are due back here at the church by next weekend. And there's still a few stars on the table and shopping lists as well. So it's not too late to purchase a gift. Our annual Christmas tree lighting will be next weekend on December 3rd, that Saturday following worship. We'll meet in the church basement for a meal, we'll sing some Christmas carols, then we'll venture outside for the lighting of our Christmas tree. There's no cost for this event, but if you'd like to bring a donation for Nightingale's Harvest, we'll be collecting through that weekend. There are poinsettia order forms available near the bulletins uh, at the front and the back and also in the church office. The deadline for ordering is December 7th, and that's going to come up pretty quick. The nominating committee is still looking for two volunteers. If you or someone you know would be willing to work with the folks on the stewardship committee, please let me or Tim Titkemeyer know. We're also seeking someone who usually worships on Saturday to serve with the Worship Life Committee. If you think you might be interested, we can get you more information on either one of those positions. Our procedure for Holy Communion has changed slightly. When you come forward, uh, pick up an empty cup from the tray located near the front pew. I'll assist, uh, I'll distribute the bread, and we have a communion assistant who will pour the wine. We also still have the pre-sealed elements available for those who would prefer a more hygienic option or for those who wish to receive grape juice instead of wine. Indicate that you'd like the pre-sealed elements by not picking up a cup. This change also means we're going to need volunteers to set up communion and be servers. If you're willing to help with either one of those jobs, please contact the church office or write me a note. Next week, following worship, we're going to do kind of a review training for setting up communion. So if you're interested, plan on hanging around after worship next week, and we'll kind of walk through what's entailed. Our faith practice reading for this week was Psalm 85. Describing the redemption that is found in God, what does the psalmist say shares a kiss? That was in verse 10. You're not even looking. Anyone else? Melissa, you've got it? Love and faithfulness, righteousness and peace. Yes, steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Be sure to pick up your peanut butter cup off the speaker before you go. And our readings each week are sequential. So this coming week, we're reading Psalm 85. Let us now prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits for worship.
also forgot to announce that some of our service music has changed for the Advent Christmas season, but it's a liturgy we used a few years ago, so it should be familiar to some, hopefully most. Will you please stand for the confession and forgiveness? <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be God's name forever. Amen. Beloved, now is the time to wake from sleep. Let us confront our sin and confess them to the one who is merciful and just. God of new beginnings, we confess that we have not welcomed your holy reign. We have strayed from your paths. We prepare for war instead of peace. We dishonor one another and your creation. Purify us with your refining fire and set us again on your way of love, that we may bear fruit worthy of repentance and welcome your coming among us. Amen. People of God, a new thing is growing in our midst, a tender branch, a living sign. By water and the Spirit, you are joined to this wonder. You have put on Christ, and your sins are washed away. Rejoice in the way of the Lord. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, save us from the threatening dangers of our sins and enlighten our walk in the way of your salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. is a time for the human heart to wait while trusting God's eternal time. How long, O oh Lord, how long? For those waiting for answered prayer, grant your steadfast patience. For those waiting in the face of uncertainty, grant unshakable confidence in your sovereign provision. For those waiting for justice and mercy to reign, grant a glimpse of your glory in our wounded world. For all of us waiting for God's kingdom to come, grant that we might have the peace of Christ as we wait, the love of Christ as we act, and the grace of Christ as we speak. This morning we light the first candle on the Advent wreath, which reminds us that throughout history, God's people have spent time waiting, wandering, and wondering about the timing of God's eternal plan. Like the people of old, we long for God's presence to illuminate the areas of our life where we are called to wait. This morning we echo the words of the psalmist, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Closing, let us pray. God of all creation, we declare that you are the eternal one. We confess to you, O Lord, that we easily grow impatient when your word is to us is to wait. Ignite within us a new and everlasting hope. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The first reading is from the book of Isaiah. The word of Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. The night is far gone, the day is near. Ha! Paul apparently has not gone out to walk the dog in the dark when it's only 5.30 in the evening. This is, after all, the darkest season of the year. The night is anything but far gone. How many of you get up to go to work while it's still dark in the morning, and then when you come home, it's dark already? It's rather depressing, isn't it? In fact, some of us get the disease called seasonal affective disorder. It simply means we get depressed this time of year because there's so much darkness and so little light. But of course, in our reading from Romans, Paul is talking about something more than shorter daylight hours. He's using the image of darkness and light 
to make a symbolic spiritual lesson, a lesson we can use to help us prepare for the Advent season. The contrasts Paul uses of night and day, dark and light, taking off and putting on, reflect the character of living in the in-between time. Currently, the old era of sin and death clashes with the new era of divine life and love that has already come into the world through Christ's death and resurrection. Symbolic light and dark has to do with putting off the hidden things, hidden either by deceit or out of shame, putting off conformity to the things of the world that are not life-giving, and putting on participating in the reign of Christ, seeking ways that are holy and life-giving. Paul further explains what he means by way of analogy. In his letter, Paul calls us to wake up and get dressed. He tells us to shed our nighttime garments, which he refers to as the works of darkness, and put on new clothing, the armor of light. I remember reading a devotional once. The author said that the first thing most of us do when we wake up in the morning is go to the bathroom. And he made a spiritual lesson out of that, saying the first task we have each day is to get rid of the wastes of yesterday. It's a rather gross analogy, but there's some truth to that. There are some things we need to remove from our lives. It's like taking out the trash on a regular basis. If we don't, the house begins to stink. If we don't remove some things from our lives, our spirituality begins to stink, too. That's one of the ways we participate in this season of Advent, preparing to receive the Christ child, looking for the things that we need to take off, to lay aside, to remove from our lives. Now, we each probably have our own list of such things, but I want to lift up the one list Paul made for us. He wrote, Let us not live in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. That's probably a pretty good list. And I'm guessing it hits different for everybody. Contrary to what the Puritans taught, the Bible doesn't really say much about drinking. Some people can have a drink now and then and be fine. For others, avoiding alcohol altogether is the wisest practice. It's not drinking that Paul warns against, but drunkenness and addictions. Those behaviors are ones that don't align with our new identities as children of light. And they're behaviors that often seek to destroy the community that is Christ's body. Paul's second pairing of negative behaviors is debauchery and licentiousness. Debauchery is defined as excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. And licentiousness has to do with throwing off moral restraints, lewd character or behavior. I'm not going to give details about what that means right now, but I think we all get the idea. The point is, we can't fully participate in the life-giving reign of Christ when we excessively indulge in the ways of the flesh. Paul is warning us not to throw away our lives in reckless living. The third pair is quarreling and jealousy. And here, Paul hits a little closer to home. We may not struggle with reveling and drunkenness. We might not have a problem with debauchery and licentiousness. But almost all of us have to deal with quarreling and jealousy. All too often, that's what the holidays are all about. And perhaps that makes this pair more dangerous than the others. 
Most of us can agree that debauchery is not a life-giving behavior. I mean, after we look up the definition, we agree that it's not a life-giving behavior. But quarreling and jealousy are so much part of our world, they tend to slip their tendrils into every part of our lives and go unnoticed. I've known many good Christians who call it defending the faith, and they embrace quarreling like it's a spiritual gift. Paul tells us to wake up to these and other works of darkness. Lay them aside for something better. And that for something better part is important. Paul wasn't interested in preserving a negative kind of purity in which people simply didn't do bad stuff. I once read a book where the author described many Christians as the do-not people. The Christian life is measured by the things we don't do. It may be easy to think of Christian life this way because many of the commandments are put in the negative sense. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not bear false witness, And some of us have concluded that the Christian life is simply a list of thou shalt nots. Now, clearly, it's good to avoid those things. But the problem with this approach to Christianity is that it sets the standards too low. By this measure, a rock could be the perfect Christian. A rock never commits reveling in drunkenness, debauchery and licentiousness, or even quarreling and jealousy. Just think of all the sins that a rock never commits. But as you know, a rock never does anything good either. So yes, we all have sins we need to get rid of. And yes, there are actions and attitudes that we are best to avoid. But that's only half of the equation. Instead of measuring our success simply by what we don't do, Paul focuses on active relationships and caring, not just on a kind of passive goodness or the absence of bad. He writes, put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. These are positive actions, not just negative ones to avoid. When Paul says it's time to wake from sleep, he's suggesting waking up to a new purpose in our lives. We have things to do. We have plans to make. We have priorities to set. When we wear Christ, when we put on the armor of light, we begin to look like Christ. Our lives begin to follow his direction. Our faith should affect the way we live together as God's people. During the Advent and Christmas season, we have many, many opportunities to do loving deeds as we reach out in concern to others in our family or in our community. Our own shopping with the stars list is an excellent example of this, which reminds me of a story. I don't remember the source, but a mother told the story that one year at Christmas, money was pretty tight. After all the bills were paid, there wasn't much left for her and the four kids to spend on each other for Christmas. That year, she took them all to the mall and gave them each a $20 bill and told them that's all they had to spend on each other. The kids didn't care. They all went off thinking of inexpensive and creative ways they could spend their $5 per person. Mom gave instructions to meet back in an hour. The hour went by quickly and pretty soon everyone gathered. Everybody was excited, and they were all hiding their bags so no one could see. The youngest daughter's bag was the smallest, but mom didn't think too much about it until they got in the car and she dropped the bag. It fell open, and candy bars fell out. 
The youngest daughter turned red and hurriedly picked up the candy bars and shoved them back in the bag. Mom was furious. She knew her youngest daughter was a little irresponsible and had a sweet tooth. But to spend all of the Christmas money on herself was unthinkable. Mom stewed the whole way home. They all rushed into the house to wrap their presents, and Mom followed the youngest daughter into her room, closed the door, and started telling her how disappointed she was in her for spending all of her money on candy bars. The little girl started to cry, and then she said, But I didn't. These aren't for me. These are the presents for you and the others. Mom asked, But what happened to the rest of the money? The little girl explained that she had been shopping, and she couldn't find anything she liked for anyone else, and while she was shopping, she saw this tree covered with angels. So she went to see what that was all about, and found an angel with the name of a little girl on it who needed a pair of gloves and a coloring book and crayons. She thought about all the things she and her family already had, and decided to use her money to buy those things for that little girl. When she finished, all she had left was enough to buy everyone in the family a candy bar. Mom learned a valuable lesson about living in the light. Putting on Jesus means we're called to put others first, not worrying about our own wants and desires. Wearing the armor of light means loving God enough to put others before ourselves. And this is something that we do always, not just as we prepare for Christmas. Amen.
Together, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God of all, your children everywhere cry out for mercy. Awaken the global church to the urgent needs of our time. Break down barriers of culture and custom and unite people of all faiths in your redemptive and healing work. God in your mercy. God of wonder, the earth's beauty and abundance is your gift. Teach us your ways of sharing resources and caring for life. Guard fragile habitats, preserve the wild places, and protect endangered plants and animals. God in your mercy. God of peace, you judge the nations. Beat our weapons into tools for serving the neighbor. Strengthen the resolve of all who work for an end to war. We pray for lasting peace in the land of Jesus' birth and other places where conflict has become the norm. God in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of loving kindness, you desire fullness of life for everyone. Fill those who hunger, comfort the grieving, and attend to those near death. Bring help and hope to any who are sick and needing your care. Today we pray especially for Leon, Gary, and Simon, for George, Louise, and all of those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. God, in your mercy. God of community, you are present when we gather in your name. Guide congregations in transition or conflict. Give wisdom to congregational councils, call committees, and ministry leaders. Keep us alert to unexpected opportunities for mission. God, in your mercy. God of promise, your goodness is everlasting. We give thanks for the lives of the faithful who now rest in you. We trust that you will bring us into the company of all the saints with rejoicing. God, in your mercy. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your Spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And that means with our money, too especially if it owns or occupies much of our hearts. So even though we're not passing the offering plates, we still take time in our worship to mark the importance of giving to our spiritual lives, returning a portion of what we have as a sign of thanksgiving and to further God's work in and through this place. Let us join together in our offering prayer. Eternal God, you make the desert bloom and send springs of water to thirsty ground. Receive these simple gifts of bread, wine, and money 
and make us messengers of your mercy and love for all in need of your healing and justice. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Will you please stand? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the beginning of creation, God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated light from darkness. In ancient times, God led the Israelites through the desert with a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. The priests of old also kept a perpetual fire burning in the temple to remind us that God is a light that cannot be extinguished. Finally, Jesus, the Word, who was with God since the beginning of creation, became flesh and lived among us. We have seen his glory shining in our world full of grace and truth. Christ's light shines in the darkness, and darkness did not overcome it. This same light has commanded us not to hide our light under a bushel basket, but to put it on a lampstand so that everyone can see it. With our lights burning brightly, we now join the saints and angels in a hymn of praise to God, the everlasting light. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs>
Will you please stand? The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Faithful God, in this meal you have remembered your mercy, bringing heaven to earth in the body and blood of Christ. As we wait for the day when all your promises will be fulfilled, sustain us and strengthen us by this holy mystery. Guide us toward your promised future, coming to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, the eternal word who dwells within Jesus, who holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, Christ is near.